Welcome to Conversations with Keith. I'm Keith Lockhart, the conductor of the Boston Pops, and this is my chance to introduce you to some of the people on the stage and behind the scenes who make the Boston Pops America's orchestra. My guest today is Larry Wolf, the principal bass of the Boston Pops. Larry's a familiar presence for Pops fans. His position puts him right on the edge of the stage. He's a big guy playing a big instrument, and well, he's known to be something of a showman. And that, Pops fans, was the patented Boston Pops section bass spin. It's a well-advertised fact that this season was to be my 25th anniversary as conductor of the Boston Pops. That may sound like a long time, but some of you may not know that one of my first conducting tasks after joining the Pops was to accompany Larry and his wonderful colleague, the late Mary Lou Speaker Churchill, in a concerto celebrating their 25th anniversary. So, simple math would tell you if it's my 25th anniversary, it must be, <laughs> yikes, yeah. his 50th. Nice picture. Larry's the tall one all the way over on the right. Ladies and gentlemen, the ever youthful, always enthusiastic Larry Wolf. Hi, Larry. Hi, Keith. Thanks for having <laughs> me on the show here. It's oh, it's, here. it's great to have you here. Thank you so much. You know, I thought I'd start out with, well, the most basic question known to mankind. Larry, why the bass? I mean, look, you know, I think people pick the flute because of its portability and, and young men uh, learn to play guitar to impress the girls. But what was it that drew you to the bass? Well, I grew up in the suburbs of Boston. I grew up in Hingham. And uh, thank you, Myron Thomas, the director of music in Hingham. There was always an instrument ready for, for those who wanted, wanted to play. And the first instrument was Mr. Thomas's instrument, the trombone. So in the fourth grade, I started with the trombone and um, discovered that I had a pretty good what I described to my students as a hand-ear coordination. In other words, if my hands are doing this, it must sound this way. And, um, and, and, and the trombone, again, being physical, and I could, I could identify with that. But I had, as in much younger years, I'd had my tonsils out, my adenoids out. I'd had benign polyps that were, that were shrunken by x-rays. Uh, and, uh, and so what happened is that the membranes in the back of my throat were just compromised. And so I kept getting sick playing the trombone. But, but the talent was obvious, and so Mr. Thomas tried a bass on me, and it stuck. And, and the thing is, as soon as I got good enough, there was an orchestra for me. It was a sixth grade orchestra, but there were some cute violinists in it. And then, uh, and, then, and then I got good enough in the sixth grade that he needed me in the junior high orchestra, and there were even cuter violinists. And, uh, and then I was in the junior high, played in the high school orchestra, and there were, there were some cute cellists at that point. Sorry, you, now, now you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> so, so you're saying that you, uh, you uh, again, picked up the bass uh, to meet girls. <laughs> yeah, that's when you, you opened that door, and I'm afraid. <laughs> I, but what are, what are the qualities of, of the instrument that draw you to it? Um, I don't know. I, not having played the bass for so long, I think I probably always listened to music from the bottom up. I heard the, I, I, would, I would hear the bottom line. If I could hear the bottom line, I could recreate the harmony or whatever was happening above it. Where, where it's funny because my wife Pam, a soprano, hears things from the top down. I mean, it would, it would make perfect sense. And so, between, so betwixt the two, you see. <laughs> so um, I just have always listened from the bottom. I've, I've listened to the, to the beats. My father liked the old the old uh, big band recordings, and, and I, 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 I turned down the bass and tried to sound like Ray Brown, you know, play, playing along with Oscar Peterson or, or with Harry, you know, Harry James or Stan Kenton. So I, I just, it just, it, it fit. The, 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 the instrument, uh, my, my aural sensibilities, my, my, um, my hand, hand to ear coordination, and the fact that there was always a place to play, the better I got. Well, especially in, in modern times, uh, the bass has become a truly virtuoso pl uh, instrument played by people with an incredible amount of technical range. I mean, I suppose the cliche is to think of the bass in kind of the, the umpa position, uh, playing the, the, the long, slow notes on, on the bottom. But in the hands of a master, such as you, for instance, uh, the bass has an, an incredible amount of, of um, 
alacrity. I mean, you can really get around on the thing. So you have a very interesting combination of both providing kind of the fundamental, the bedrock for the orchestra and also taking a, a solo turn every now and then. I, yes, and I still remember my, my, my teacher at, at one time was Leslie Martin, a member of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He, I, was, I was a student for five years and every so often I would, I would, I would uh, go out of the lesson plan and, he, and he'd, look, he'd look at me and say, why the bird calls? And so, but still. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you were messing around even then, huh? Yeah, even, yeah Keith, even then. <laughs> Some things never change. So, Larry, about 10 years after you got into the orchestra in 1970, you became the assistant principal bass of the Boston Symphony and the principal, therefore, of the Boston Pops. And what, what did that experience teach you? What is playing for the Pops taught you as opposed to more traditional symphonic outlets? Uh, it's a wonderful question. And um, when I first joined the Pops, I was in the back of the section in the, in the, in the far, I mean, it would be orchestra, uh, audience right, orchestra left corner there with Chester Schmitz and Bob Olson. And it was a wonderful column of bass that we, that we delivered to the hall. But, you know, um, I was, again, had, had a lot of technique and, and uh, just an, an, an upstart bassist always pushing the envelope and just, just ask me to play the first page of any cello concerto. Well, don't, because I can. <laughs> but, um, but I thought, look at all the stuff I can do. And here I am just keeping the beat. And I'm, I'm, I'm buried in the back of the section there and I can't see anything and I can't hear anything. It's loud and I'm feeling like I'm capable of so much more. And for, I must admit that my attitude for, for a few years was not exemplary. I, I mean, I, I have to admit it. I, I go there only to say that when I got a principal and I, and I got on the edge of the stage and I just see such, such a spectrum of, of, of humanity as I look out on the stage and I do my best to interact with them and I realize, wait, I'm just keeping the beat, yes, but I'm, um, I'm doing so with the same artistry that, that, I, that, I, that I apply to Beethoven I, I'm, I'm try, I, and, I, I, and these people deserve it. People um, all the time remark from our audience, one of the reasons I think you're one of the better known, better, more recognized people in the Boston Pops is people remark, you kind of, uh, every single concert, and we've done a lot of them together, and you did a lot before I even showed up. <laughs> um, every single concert, the you make some sort of personal connection with the audience that's right down there at your feet, right? I mean, you they feel like they know you before they leave. I, that's, that's as much for me as for them, because at least, um, I know who I'm playing for. I know who I'm playing to. It, it just it personalizes my 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 approach a little bit, and it keeps my attitude. It keeps my attitude good. It unlocks me from myself, then reminds me of just how lucky I am to have been to be doing what I was born to do, and doing it with with um, credibility and uh, and salary. Well, you know, it's uh, it's it's an important reminder. I mean, all of us sometimes get down in the repetition of our task that we do for a living, even if it's what we chose and, and we're very, very lucky to do. And every now and then, it's nice to have something that reminds you that we're the luckiest people in the, in the world and that we get to do what we said we would do if we didn't have to make a living and people pay us to do that. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. And, and that, that luck also, I, I look, I, I try to find the joy everywhere and, and, and um, so that I do not, uh, I'm going to say, become the great gray face, as uh, Gene Shepard used to call it. You must have uh, some really cool memories uh, in the 50 years in the BSO, and particularly uh, these, these years as Pops principal. I assume you probably went on that first uh, Boston Pops Orchestra Japan tour with John Williams. Oh, yeah, where, where John had, I, I forget. Oh, I forget all the places we went, but still, that, I mean, with John Williams in Japan, uh, it's, it's as, as if he wasn't admired here. He's a, a musical <laughs> no, god in Japan. He's, he is worshipped as a, as a deity in Japan, I think. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. And, uh, and uh, just, and, 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 and Japanese audiences are already so, and so enthusiastic. And, um, and to the point where after a concert, I'm going out the stage door, and if someone recognizes me, they want my autograph. No, it's wonderful. I love I love performing there. I've I've gone with the Pops Touring Orchestra four times over there, but I've been over there with several Japanese orchestras over the years and all that. And 
I love making music for them because the enthusiasm is so genuine. But I will say that, you know, my name doesn't have enough recognition to always get the restaurant reservation. But if I tell them I know John Williams, that always helps. <laughs> Did you do the Super Bowl with me? In oh, Japan yeah. Too? That's no. something I'll never forget. Oh, nor, nor will I, as I because um, we, we because I remember sitting right next to the another bass player, Susan Hagen, and we're wa we're watching Vinatieri's uh, uh, kick. We're, we're in the end zone on, on that on that side where, where we watched the kick go over and down, and we look at each other and, <laughs> and we and when we realized that the Pats <laughs> won that time. It, it, well, it was a, it was a really interesting experience. You'll remember that was the first Super Bowl after nine eleven. Um, and so there was this whole layer, huge layer of security that none of us had ever experienced before. Had all of a sudden all the bag checks for, you know, eighty thousand people in the in the Superdome and that sort of thing. Uh, and then to start off, people always assumed that we were down there playing. We we played the pregame show uh, alongside uh, Paul McCartney. We did some of Lincoln Portrait with the um, five voices of the. At that point, five living uh, ex-U.S. presidents. Um, oh, oh it yes. Was, it was an amazing, yeah, powerful experience. It was a video showing the hole where the World Trade Center used to be. It was really, it was really something. But uh, people assume we went there because the Pats went there. But uh, when when we got the call about going there, I think the Pats were like three and four or something like that. They were. There was no sign they were going to the Super Bowl, but we were. We were selected by the NFL and by Fox because they really wanted to. They wanted to do something very American, very straight down the middle, very paper, very not flavor of the month. In terms of what makes playing in the pops different, uh, we have we try to uh, feature various members of the orchestras in solo capacity. We try to come up with fun kind of pops-driven ways to do that. And a few years ago, a local girl named Good, named Megan Trainer. Uh, came up with a, a song that was a big hit. It was called All About That Bass. And uh, the, our planning people, we were sitting around the office going, what can we do with this? And I said, well, obviously, we need to do a, uh, a version of that uh, that highlights uh, some of the fine players of bass instruments in our orchestra. So you, along with tuba, a bass drum, contrabassoon, uh, we we asked you to come out onto the front of the stage and perform a solo version of All About That Bass. And we have a little excerpt of that, if that won't embarrass you too badly. Let's see it. on bass drum, Greg Henniger on contrabassoon, and Cindy Myers on various flutes. All about that bass. So I think one of the most interesting things about doing this is that our audience, our fans, people who think they know you, get to know more about you than, than they ever have before. And I guess my question is, who are you when you're not with the Boston Pops and the Boston Symphony? I know, for instance, 
that you're uh, quite an accomplished composer and arranger. I've uh, done several of your arrangements. I know uh, that before I got here, uh, you even had a trumpet concerto uh, with our former principal trumpet uh, okay. premiered by the Boston Pops. That was actually one of my most incredible memories was, the, was the, uh, doing that trumpet concerto and, I'm, and uh, John Williams conducted, uh, Tim Morrison played, and, I'm, and, I, and John allowed me to go sit and listen to it. And I'm sitting at a table with Billy May. <laughs> and, 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 he, and he, gave, he gave me that one a wonderful look and a thumbs up and i said oh i can die now i didn't die here i am <laughs> but but what that is, that what, is so cool billy may for people who don't know one of the the greatest of uh, jazz composers and arrangers who did several things for the pops along the years as well so and i'm also told and this is fascinating to me uh, that you are a uh, kind of a major league handyman and a, and a pretty darn good carpenter? Yeah, uh, I, I, I fix things. I, I basically, at, at this point, yeah, I'm Mr. Fix-It, a handyman. I just wait for stuff to break so I can fix it, whether, whether it be um, uh, Wi-Fi or whether it be a garage door, things like that. As for finished carpentry, no, I have never been able to miter three-dimensional molding. Sorry. I have well, to can. <laughs> how about How about at this point, I mean, you know, I think your first project as a finished carpenter should be to, um, well, how about making a base? No, I'm going to leave that. Uh, the fixing of the bases, I'm going to leave to my colleague, Dennis Roy, and the making of them uh, to, to various other people around. Oh. Hey, in the same spirit of getting to know you, some quick, random, unexpected questions, just one sentence answers. What's your favorite food? Oh, my goodness. Uh, beef stew. Beef stew. You're a beef oh. stew kind of guy. Yeah, yeah. What is your, I mean, all of us who are trained as classical artists like to think of ourselves as being extremely erudite musicians. And we, uh, people ask, what are we listening to? We say, well, you know, the collected works of Xenakis or whatever. But what is your musical guilty pleasure? Are you a closet disco fan, for instance? Um, are you a big jazz fan? Um, self-made earworms i wake up hearing music i've composed is there anything better do you write it down um no no do sometimes it's, it? sometimes it's music i already wrote Good. well the important thing is there hopefully you still like what you wrote so that's, <laughs> that's uh, well yeah in fact, in fact i have to i have, to, I have you know i i have the pops to thank for for that particular voice as well because um you know, I mean, I, I, I was I, I was a Tanglewood in the 60s and, and, and you know, Gunther Schuller, 12-tone music, uh, all manner of experimental avant-garde. And I could do all that stuff. I could write music like that, but I'd rather write I'd rather write a good tune and, and, and have it harmonized correctly. And I, I just, just find find a style. Yes, that means I, I hear chords. Yes, that means I am, if not tonal, consonant. And so it and, and it was the pops. It was it was actually seeing the pops audience and realizing those are the people I'm writing for. It's got to be something that 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 they want to hear once and they may want to hear again. Yeah, that they have to enjoy. At yeah. the end of the day, I think music has to leave you with something uh, beyond just intellectual appreciation. Absolutely. Uh, it has to be something in there that you really want to take in. Next question. Your favorite TV show? Oh, it's frankly... My wife, Pam, loves her craggy British dramas. I sit down, <laughs> make, some, make some herb tea and sit down with her and watch them. And so, are, you watching, are you watching The Crown? Uh, pa Pam has been. But right now, uh, she's been watching Miss Marple reruns. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, and so that, that's that sort of TV show and documentaries, I suppose. Um, if I, things where I can understand my world a little bit better. Here's an interesting question. What's, if you have one, what's your life motto? Uh, well, I've, I've been actually, that's a wonderful question because I've been working on it. it. I'll be 72 this summer. And as much as I've accomplished, I feel like I've like accomplished nothing. Uh, so I, I keep wanting, I, I still, maybe you can help me, maybe the audience can help me figure out how to say that um, I'm going to spend the rest of my life figuring out what the beginning of my life meant. <laughs> Well, I think you said it pretty well right there, actually. But we'll have everybody uh, work on refining that and send their ideas in. <laughs> but, you know, the composition of, of the bass section uh, with the longevity of both 
you and your position and your longtime stand partner, the principal base of the Boston Symphony, Ed Barker, the two of you uh, being so consistent for that period of time have really kind of built a base section in your image. Uh, you, uh, this Boston is a mecca for aspiring base students. Uh, I, I can't think of another place that, that uh, uh, great base students want to go polish their craft more than Boston. And it's not an exaggeration to say, and I'm not just saying this because I work with you guys. Uh, I think overall, uh, more people than not would say that Boston has one of the finest, if not the finest, base section in the world. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, would, agree, I would agree with that. And, and yeah, I've been sitting next to Ed Barker for, well, since 1980. 1980, so that that she has to do the math. Don't do the math. Uh, and, <laughs> a long time. Yeah, a long time. So that, um, and and I again, I talk a lot to my students about this. About I'm sitting assistant principal. I'm not the boss, but I have to understand what the boss does so that I can either telegraph it, support it, just be a a messenger of 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 what Ed wants of, of what Ed wants to do whether it's in terms of note placement intonation phrasing and just telegraph that to the to the other members of the section and and uh, turnabout is fair play when i said it pops and ben levy is to my right he does the same thing so in other words that's the gift that keeps on giving us i've tried my best to be to be the best assistant i can and in, and i get the same in return what i see when i look on it from the point of view of an interested outsider is I see a lot of people who are motivated by the same things, who bring the same sense of professionalism, but also the same sense of joy that you bring to your work every day. I think you've modeled that really well, and I think it's reflected in the people who work with you. And I know that they love and respect you, and they, even after all these years, and you know, as you know, when you're working in orchestra together, you spend so much time together over the years that eventually it's like it's it's like a marriage. But but this uh, this marriage seems to be seems to be working really well. Uh, a few of your colleagues, uh, specifically uh, Ben Levy, uh, whom you mentioned, is your is your number two in the Boston Pops. Todd Sieber, uh, your other stand partner, Ed Barker, and the new guy on the block, Carl Anderson whom I'm looking forward to meeting and working with, who got into the orchestra but has not gone through his first pop season yet. Well, they put together a little tribute, a little happy an anniversary Larry um, sort of surprise. Okay. And I thought we'd go out on that note. And just from me, um, as somebody who has enjoyed your musical excellence, but also your emotional uh, and professional support for a quarter of a century, Happy anniversary, happy 50th. Uh, if it's not too bold of me to ask it, don't go anywhere just yet. We, we need your enthusiasm and we need your skills. Happy anniversary, Larry, and thanks for being my first ever guest on Conversations with Keith. And, and thank you and same to you.
Thank you for watching Conversations with Keith. To see more, visit bso.org slash at home. Don't miss the next video by hitting subscribe. We'll see you next time.